Good morning. Good morning. Uh, now for the originally uh, planned message that I was supposed to do, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, the nice thing about uh, speaking two weeks in a row, which never really happens, is um, you can, if you messed up anything from last week, you can come and fix it this week. Um, but I'll tell you, um, like I sort of mentioned uh, last week, that passage has sort of been on my heart because um, of just different things in the assembly. But uh, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is a brilliant writer and ends with the, resur- the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and I just want to read a verse real quick before we just ask the Lord to um, bless the reading of his word and just opening the word this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I, I, I just want us to see the big picture real quick. You can keep your finger in 15. Uh, but real quick in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I have to remind myself and, and one another what the context of this passage and this book was written to. The church in Corinth wasn't thriving, beloved. This was a bunch of sinners trying to figure this whole thing out. And when I read in verse 10, it says, uh, Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I don't know about you, but if any of you are married, this is hard. I mean, have you, I don't know, are you of the same mind as your spouse? Praise God, write a book, will you? I'll read it. Um, this, is, this is hard. Like, what God has called us unto the Lord Jesus Christ is hard. And those passages that we have been talking about all the way from 11 to 14, I don't care who you are, any speaker up here was sunk on arrival. You're talking about tongues, you're talking about prophecy, you're talking about women when they should and when they shouldn't speak, you're talking about head coverings, you're talking about things that are so controversial within the church that no matter who comes up here, you're sunk on arrival and you're going to probably upset somebody. That's why Paul writes this whole letter, because it's to a church that has divisions. But Paul was wise to end in chapter 15, because at the end of the day, we need to minor in the minors and we need to major in the majors. There are things that I can come alongside you, and I'd be happy, again, I said last week, I'd be happy to talk to you more, and I would love for, I mean, a brother came up to me at prayer meeting and said, brother, I disagreed with your message last week. Praise God. Praise God that we as a family can have those great, flippant, straight conversations where someone can come up to a brother and say, brother, I disagreed with your message last night, last week. Praise God. So let's sit down together, commit to one another, and get through the scripture together because that's what discipleship as we're about to talk about next weekend is all about if we're all just going to sit around and pretend we all agree with each other that's just ludicrous but there is something that is non-negotiable in the scripture and that is the gospel of jesus christ Amen. that's the major um one of the best things i ever did and i say the story all the time matt and joanna niebor uh cheryl palmer's uh, son and daughter-in-law were my youth group leaders at northgate um, there, there's an old saying, people won't remember what you taught them, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Um, that, that, I can't tell you as a teacher, nobody's going to remember what I teach in my classroom. Are you kidding me? I, if that were so, no offense, I mean, we'd know how to read the hymnal better, <laughs> <'cause>, right? <laughs> um, love you all, but, and that's fine. Joyful noise. Praise God, right? That's good. It's, it's good. Um, But they remember how you made you feel. But there is one thing that I remember them teaching, and it was about um, the non-negotiables of Scripture. And I'll tell you what, I I was a fiery, I know this is shocking to many of you, I was a fiery 18-year-old who would take on anybody and anything who wanted to challenge on Scripture. Um, Because to me, I was that lame 10th grader who was looking at doctrine, and I was interested because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, But that whole series changed my life because it made me um, understand that there was a way to coexist with believers when you didn't agree with them. That is one of the most important Christian truths in the New Testament. Because at the end of the day, we are in a dispensation. We are at a time of grace. We are. We are not under the law. If we were under the law, there would be far less things to talk about and discuss and debate upon. 
There was no debate on the one day a year on Yom Kippur, which is coming up, that the Day of Atonement, that there was a high priest under the tribe of Levi who was to go into the Holy of Holies and to sacrifice unto the umpt degree detail. There was no debate about how that was supposed to be done. But how we gather, yeah, it's principles. It's hard. But they didn't have something that we have today, and that's the Holy Spirit. We have in each believer a holy, the, holy, the, uh, the Holy Spirit living in us, and we have a relationship individually, and we can be Bereans. We can search the word of God. We can have discussion because, beloved, if we all agreed with each other and we were all on one ship, then what do we have to discuss on Sunday morning? If we understood everything in this book, if we understood everything about the Lord, then the Great Commission would have been go and make disciples and make them live on an island alone. And it's not. So I have to start the passage in talking about this, that we are a family committed, that sometimes you and I are going to disagree on things, and that's okay. But the non-negotiable of Scripture is that Christ died, was buried, and raised again. Period. Period. So let's just pray and, and open this, this book together as a family and... Um, I'm just thankful for this passage because it's so much less controversial. So let's just, pray, let's just pray real quick and ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Father, we just come into your presence this morning just thanking you for the family here at Blaisdell Gospel Chapel. Father, it has been an extraordinary privilege for so many of us to see um, what you've been doing the last few years. And Father, it hurts. But Lord, at the end of the day, you care more about our holiness than our happiness. And uh, Father, may this time that we open your word for the next half hour be a time that we can be edified, encouraged, brought together, united, so that we can indeed go out and share the gospel of your, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray, Father, that we be encouraged by the gospel this morning, and we pray this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. So um, I have been tasked to read the first 11 verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, so let's just uh, read the passage. It says in verse 1, uh, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I am persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, by the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. So let's uh, jump into the passage, starting in verse 1. Uh, like I said, Paul has been addressing some of the issues practically within the church uh, at Corinth. Um, Side note, remember, it's not the Baptists at Corinth, it's not the Brethren at Corinth, not the Lutherans at Corinth, it was the church at Corinth, right? And, and he's addressing things that maybe weren't, uh, not maybe, they weren't as the Lord desired in their midst. But he comes into verse 1 and he says this, More, uh, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received in which you stand. It was important for Paul to understand and for the church of Corinth to understand that although you have all these problems, there are things that can unite us and make sure that we know we're on the same team and that we're a family. You have received the gospel and you stand on it. That no matter what, no matter gobbledygook, no matter what, we're all on the team of the Lord Jesus or we're not. And uh, one passage, uh, a verse that sort of goes with this over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I just want to read it real quick. Uh, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as a word of men, but as in the truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Um, it, it's just so important to understand that the gospel is something that is not received from man. 
This is not a bedtime story. This is not a myth. This is not a, folk, a fable, a folklore. This is a story uh, that actually happened. Um, but specifically, this church in Corinth were unlike the Galatians, which it says in Galatians chapter 1 that they were um, quickly going away from the gospel that they had received. But in verse 2, um, this is important, by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Um, listen, I, I'll be the first to tell you I believe, I do believe in eternal security. I believe in eternal security. Um, because I believe it on the, on, it has to do with the work of the believer, it has to do with the work of the Lord, but on his end, the Lord, Jesus Christ, Right? I believe that the Lord, and I think we all would agree, that the Lord on his end will never forsake someone uh, on his end. Whether we like it or not, though, okay, there are times in the scripture that it says, if you hold fast the word. There's parables in the New Testament that do talk about how seed can fall on bad soil and what happens. It's taken away. I am not here as the Lord to judge who is going to get into heaven and who is not, but I can tell you one thing. If someone here does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today, you're in trouble. Okay? Um, where it says in that, that phrase, believed in vain, it, it's so interesting. It just uh, in camp ministry, I've gone away from when were you saved, and I've gone more towards what do you believe today? Because frankly, I don't really care what you believed at five years old. I don't think the Lord really does either. I think the Lord cares about where you are today and what do you believe today. Sure, you made a prayer when you were five, but is he Lord today in your life? And I don't, I'm not here to say what happens in salvation. I believe that once you're saved, that the Lord, you're born again, you can't be born again again. But in a practical place in where you're living today, if you're someone who said a prayer when you're five, but you're not following the Lord Jesus Christ, you're missing on eternal life today. Whatever that means for you. Forget when you're dead, the living, you're sacrificing an adventure of a lifetime. You're sacrificing relationship with him. But what I will say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 and 18, there is a clear truth and a clear teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ says. A good tree will bear good fruit, and a bad tree is going to bear bad fruit. I say this to my kids at camp all the time. If you're going to sit here and you're going to tell me that you're an apple tree, but you have no apples, I'm going to be skeptical. If you're going to say that you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and there's no fruit in your life, I'm going to be skeptical. And you should be too. Because really at the end of the day, Romans 10.9 just turn to it. I, I just think a lot of us know this passage, but who cares? It, it, it's such an important passage that I think we major on one part of the passage and we don't major on another, right? It's one of the things we give as a verse of insurance. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? We always emphasize on the part of the believer if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But why don't we emphasize the title that needs to come out of our mouths? The Lord Jesus Christ. That title is a title that is above all names. It is something that demands submission on the part of the believer to give and recognize the authority of the Lord in their lives. So I'm sorry, beloved, what I read in the word and, and there's an old saying, if it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it might be a duck. But I think we can do a lot of damage to young people by giving them assurance of a prayer at five years old when they have no interest in the Lord Jesus Christ today. That's dangerous. That's dangerous because at the end of the day, there are people who believe in vain. I have seen good people go into that tank, not specifically, but people who have been baptized at churches who come out later and say, you know what, I never really believed. It happens. And the only person who can give assurance is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's the one who writes the names in the book of life, and the Holy Spirit is the one who testifies in the believer. 
So be very careful with our kids, and I, I get it. I have a kid on the way. They're, the worst thing I ever want to do is, is to give a kid for, false assurance because they said some magic words, and I mean that reverently, right? We say that the, the prayer doesn't save someone. It's the genuine belief. And if someone's going to say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then they will have an interest in that relationship as Lord. The demons believe, right? Right? Isn't that what Jesus says? The demons believe. If the demons believe and you believe, then what's the difference? It's because we recognize him as Lord. That's the difference. So when people say, oh, well, someone made a profession when they were five. Are they confessing today that he is Lord of their lives and he is practically and really working in the life of the believer? And I'm not here to point fingers because at the end of the day, even my wife... I don't know if she's going to heaven. I, I see the fruit. She makes a confession. I believe in my heart, but I don't know. The only person you know who's on the road to heaven, the narrow way, is you. And I, frankly, have no business pointing the figures at who is and who isn't. But as a brother in Christ, as sisters in Christ, we can encourage one another on that walk. And that's my challenge this morning. Can you look in your life and see the fruit? Can you see the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in your life? And if not, why? Why? So going on the passage, um, in verse 3, um, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, for I delivered, I, I sort of alluded to this earlier, it says, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received. Um, it, the origin of the gospel is, stu is stunning. It, it, it's, it's extraordinary because it's the riskiest, um, and I, I hope you understand where I'm coming from, from the world's view, it's the riskiest religion that the world's ever seen. Really. Uh, we're, we have a book that doesn't just say the past and the present, it tells the future. That's risky. Um, we testify that God himself became man, died, buried, and rose again. Can you prove that? Yeah, you can prove that. I can tell you that there was a man named Jesus, that there was a man on this earth who died, was buried, and he rose again. You can prove that, but you can also disprove it. It's a risky faith. It's not like in the book of Galatians chapter 1. There are so many different religions in the world. If you, if you see the common thread, um, Paul in, the, in Galatians chapter 1 says this, Beware of any gospel that is given to you by an angel of light. Do you know how many religions have started in the world because of an angel of light? For instance, the book um, in uh, the Mormon church, the Church of Latter-day Saints, the gospel came from a man by himself in private in a cave getting two plates in Egyptian Hebrew in a language that only he could read and was visited by an angel of light, according to the Book of Mormon, and he was given a gospel that was supposed to restore the true church. In Islam, Muhammad was visited by an angel. Not once did he ever say that he was visited by God. He was visited by an angel of light and was given the Quran. There are so many different ways in, in the world, and it's always given privately. But Christ was not private in the least when it came to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does it say? He testified to over 500 people. Before he ascended 40 days after his resurrection, he was all about his father's business. He appeared to all of these people. It wasn't private. And Paul wants to make this distinction that he received it from the Lord. He didn't make this up, folks. There was no secret cave meeting. I have a quote from Spurgeon that I really uh, appreciated. It says this uh, from Charles Spurgeon. It says, uh, notice that the preacher does not make the gospel. If he makes it, it is not worth your naming. Originality in preaching, if it be originality, uh, originality uh, in the statement of doctrine is falsehood. We are not makers and inventors. We are repeaters. We tell the message that we have received. I mean, this creed, really, this is what this would be known as, in verse 3 and verse 4, was probably starting to be circulated not even 50 years after Christ had died. 
This is something that was being well known within the church at that time for centuries. And they knew these things, that Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again according to the scriptures. These are the things that people need to know. But, I, I, I mean, one day in heaven isn't going to be precious, and I've said this before at the platform, but I'm going to say it again. Isn't it, isn't it going to be precious that we can ask the Lord Jesus Christ himself and say, Lord, how did I get saved? Because I want to know all the way back from Adam how I got here. I want to know. And he's going to be able to know all the details because we have time, right? We have time to hear from the Savior the story that somehow included your name and my name. And I want to know what happened. But the most precious thing for all of us is, sure, were there different people who led us to the Lord? Yeah. But it all comes from one source, and that's from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The one who said, for as I live, you shall live also, is the gospel in which we preach today. It has not changed for 2,000 years. Hasn't changed. The blessed gospel, the good news, has not changed. I mean, isn't that exciting? Have, have you ever played telephone, that game telephone with kids? So it's, it's a game where you, like, you say some crazy cockamamie thing in one person's ear, and then like, they, they whisper it to like 20 people, and by the end, what happens? It is crazy. I mean, you could say something like, oh, I knitted a scarf, and it'll be like, we had three baby cows. It's crazy, like how the message changes. But the gospel's never changed. By God's grace, the gospel's never changed. Because it's a story like no other. But I think what's important, and sometimes we forget, and, and again, the, the, the um, book, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, has really changed my faith in so many ways. If you've never read it, it's like 300 pages, but it's a, it's a good book if you're into that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it, it's the story of a man in the 70s who, who, questioned, um, if, who questioned if the if, if gospel, if the Bible was real, and Someone told him, and rightfully so, if you can disprove the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then the whole thing topples like a, a house of cards. If you can disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have nothing to stand on. Right? That's what Paul says. If there is no resurrection, we have no hope. But what's really transformed my faith in just being able to share the gospel with people, um, like... I, I'll read this. Um, you know, the, there's some hymns that we, we all individually enjoy more than others. But, the, you know, there's that one verse that says, I know, I know he lives because he lives in my heart. Like, do you understand how crazy that sounds to the world? Like, if, you're, if someone comes up to you, how do you know that Jesus is real? Well, because I felt him. Right? I mean, we also have teenagers coming up and saying, I feel I'm in love. I mean, who's right? Feelings are deceptive, right? The, the heart is deceitful above all else. Um, and, and, and we as believers, we know what we're talking about, right? I, I know he's real because he's in my heart. I totally, I get it because we're part of the family and we speak the same language. I get it that there's a real experience we have with the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, right? I, um, but to the world, that just sounds ludicrous. Where, do, where does God live? In me. I mean, did you hear what I just said? It, it sounds crazy. Um, but it's a whole new ball game and for anybody who wants to get better at sharing the gospel to look at the facts. The, there, the reason I believe, and I tell my kids at work all the time, the reason I believe in the faith that the Bible preaches is because of the facts. It's not because of what I believe in. And it comes down to verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. I can prove that. Let's turn over. Uh, we're going to spend some time here in John chapter 19. Right? There, there's three parts of the gospel. And, and when kids ask, um, and, and maybe adults, maybe we ask, what is the gospel? It really does come down to this passage. We add a lot of gobbledygook and complicate a lot of stuff when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to the scriptures, it is simple belief. This is the good news. Paul breaks it down, and the early church knew this. Uh, first, there, there's three things, as I've been harping on the whole morning. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. 
Now, before I go into this passage in John chapter 19, um, I have a warning for all of us this morning because I'm a teacher. I can read body language. We have about 15 minutes left, and I can always read the lull, and when we start going comatose, we start losing attention throughout the way. I have the constant concern in my own life, in all of our lives, that the Gospels become stale. How many times do we come to meetings and we go, oh, here we go, it's the Gospel message. Yeah, 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 we know the answers. Yeah, 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 we know the words. Give me some teaching. God, forgive us. Lord, forgive us if that's our hearts. No, Lord, I, I don't want to hear the good news again. I need to hear new stuff to fill my head. Lord, forgive us. The gospel in Romans chapter 1, it is the power for those who believe. Guys, there's no plan B. There's no other gospel. There's no other message to share. On your dying bed, that's what you want to talk about, predestination versus free will. That's what you're going to say on your dying bed. I'd have to know. No, it's the gospel. It's going to come back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you, I have 12 minutes, and I actually believe I'm going to end on time. The Lord must be returning soon. Um, but I'm telling you, please, if you are coming into this message right now, and you're up, oh, here comes the gospel, you're in danger. You're in danger if the gospel is becoming stale, and you're like, can we fast forward through this part? Lord, forgive us. But I'm going to read, in, starting in John chapter 19 and verse 17, some of the most precious facts, not opinions, facts that the world's ever heard. And in verse 17, and he bearing his cross, which is Jesus, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What have I written? I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also their tunic. Now their tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, Therefore, among themselves, Let us not... Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, uh, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they have cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple, whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing the, that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. There's the death of the king. Um, I wonder when we read these red letters, um, we read them in the comfort of our own pews. As we can see, <clears throat> the soldiers, uh, in verse 34, they pierced his side, therefore he, we know that the blood and water came out, therefore he died from asphyxiation. Reason being is because uh, the only way on the cross to breathe was to lift yourself up. But see, we have the comfort of our own meetings to sit here and say, it is finished. But do you understand that Christ had to lift up his whole body and everything within him to say things like this? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You think it was clear? You think it was just flippantly said? No, it was because he had to lift his dying corpse on the tree to say those words. His last words, it is finished. And it was done. The 
the propitiation for our sins, the payment for our sins, was accomplished in one person, the man Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, there's no plan B. And if this doesn't excite your heart, I'm not looking for pom-poms, but excites your heart where it moves your feet and moves your lips and it moves your heart and it moves your mind, then why not? We have no other message to preach other than Christ crucified, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We preach Christ crucified because without this crucifixion, we have no hope. The wrath of God, as it says, he who believes not in the Son shall not see life for the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God is not meant to abide on you. If you're someone in who has never Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. Do you understand that the wrath of God, sure, you deserve it. I deserve it because of sin. It should have. It should have gone on me, but it didn't. It shouldn't. Because the wrath of God, the wrath, the judgment for your sin was paid for on the cross so that you could be justified just as if it never happened. Do you understand the cost of your salvation? Because I think if we started to be in wonder of the, uh, the, the good news, the gospel of our salvation, then breaking a bread really wouldn't be so boring to us. Right? We come and remember the same old thing every single week. The body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Frankly, when I was younger, it was boring to me. It was so boring to me. The silence. The silence. But the older you get, I hope the wonder continues because you know what kind of person you are. I hope every Sunday when we come here and remember him, we understand more and more it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. Getting married has revealed the most ugly parts of my heart. And people tell me kids ain't much better. <laughs> um, but what a wonderful Savior we have. Amen. So the second thing is the burial. So going on in John chapter 19, we see the burial. It says in verse 31, Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, uh, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the others who were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who had seen had testified and testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that, that you may believe. For these things were written... Uh, these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. Another scripture says that they looked upon the one whom they pierced. Um, the burial, and sometimes I feel like we forget this. I, I feel like we always talk about the death and resurrection of Christ, but the burial is, uh, means something to the Lord because he said it in his word. The reason about the burial is because, again, it's something you can tangibly see and experience, and Without the burial, there's no resurrection, right? It's not that he died and poof. No. It says that as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so also was the sun in the heart of the earth for three days. That's what it says. Um, I'm not here to debate if that was hell or the grave, but I do know it was bad. And, um, but we also see the fulfillment, right? In, in, in prophecy, Isaiah 53, verse 9 um, he, he makes his grave with the wicked, but his tomb with the rich. Um, right? That's a fulfillment of Joseph of Arimathea, Matthew chapter 27. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, gave up his sepulcher, the tomb that the risen king could go in. So the burial tells us that he died, but as it says, the resurrection, um, the death proves the sacrifice, the burial proves his manhood, his, his humanhood, his human kindness. Those are all made up words. Um, <laughs> but the resurrection proves his perfection. That he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might know the righteousness of God in him. 
The resurrection proclaims to the whole world that he was no liar and that he was exactly who he says he was. It's the thing that proclaimed to the world that I don't know one person, I know many people who have died, I don't know one person who after three days walked out of the grave. I don't know one person because therefore he cannot just be a mere man. He can't. A five-year-old can tell you that. <laughs> Nobody walks out of the grave three days later. And if they do, counseling's available, I guess. But I, I, I mean, th this stuff does not happen, folks. And in closing, as we start to wind down, right, we, we talked about this. Um, it, it is according to the scripture and in, in verses, so I can just get through the passage and say I did. Um, verses 15, uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verses 5 through 7. Um, the fact of the matter is just that nobody saw the resurrection, right? Can we all agree with that? Nobody saw the resurrection, but a lot of people saw the resurrected Christ. Cephas, who is Peter, in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 34, it says that Christ appeared to him. Uh, it talks about the 12. Um, it talks about how Christ came, right, in, in, in a room, and he said, peace be still. And he says, look at my hands, look at my feet, look at the piercings, right? He appeared to the 12. He appeared to over 500 people. And it's not explicitly said in the gospel, but some scholars believe in Matthew chapter 28, verses 10, 16, and 17. It talks about how he appeared to people. Um, at the end of the day, uh, people like James in John chapter 7, verse 5, um, if you actually read closely, even his half-brother at first didn't even believe in Jesus. But then later, James, as it says in the passage of Witnesses, um, in Acts 1, 14, he's listed among the followers, the apostles. In Acts chapter 15, he's known as a significant figure and a leader. Why? Because in verse 8... Verse 8, we start to see Paul's self-identification with the resurrected Christ. It says in verse 8 that, Then last of all, he who is seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Um, so my one Greek word of the day um, is that word born is really interesting. One of the issues that Paul had with the Church of Corinth and other churches is people questioned his apostleship because he was not with the original 12. But we know from the book of Acts, right, that Christ appeared to Paul and he says, Brother Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Right? He had an experience with the resurrected Christ, and because of the wonder and glory of the Son, he could not even in his hardened heart deny the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ while he was in his presence. But one of the Greek words right here is electro, electrona, um, which actually doesn't even mean born. It means to come from ugly birth. I'm going to say some words, and we all know that we are against them, but this is what in Greek what it means. It literally means um, stillbirth, miscarriage, or abortion. That Paul came through... And he uses this harshness of word to tell the Corinthians that I didn't come the natural way, but I came through the hardship of Christ. Why? Because I was a persecutor of the church. How can you not love Philippians 3? It's one of my favorite chapters in all scripture where he says, I was to the law, right? I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was to the law faultless. There's 613 laws in the Old Testament. And this guy really believed he was faultless of the law. That's impressive. But he says, I consider all dung compared to the knowledge of Christ. Knowing the Savior is far better. Paul had to learn this the hard way. I mean, he was blind for not just a few hours, for a few days. And Ananias, he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to me has come and that you may see. And so... In sort of in closing, I, I wonder if we can identify with Paul this morning in our own testimonies, who says that I'm the least of the apostles. He was someone who experienced the resurrected Christ. And in verse 10, I hope you, if you're an underliner, to me this is an underlying moment. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Life is hard with him. I'd hate to see it without him.
how can we not sit here this morning amazed by the graciousness of our God? And I know, without a shadow of a doubt, there have been things in this assembly that have been hard in the last two, three weeks. I know that. A brother went to be with the Lord. That's hard. That's hard. I don't care who you are. That's hard. But as I live, you shall live also. Oh, is that hope not the only thing that can get you through a day sometimes? Amen? I, I, I mean, but I hope we recognize it's by the grace of God we are where we are, and it's not about good behavior this morning. I hope we can, I hope we can recognize that our, the families and the spouses and the, it, the stories and, and the things, whether you're, you know, some of our young teenagers in the room or some of our not teenagers in the room, I hope you can look back on your life and, and give the credit and the glory to the only one who deserves it. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know him this morning, you are missing out on the greatest gift the world has ever seen. But if you identify as a disciple this morning, I pray for each one of us that the gospel would not be stale to our mouths, wouldn't be stale to our hearts, would it be the power to those who believe. Let's just give him thanks. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do come into your presence thanking you again for this passage and for these wonderful truths. And, and, and Father, um, at the end of the day, may we major in this truth, this great, glorious gospel of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be quick to share this with even the church, but with those who do not believe that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. And that the story doesn't end there. Father, if there's someone who does not know you, who's never accepted the invitation to be born again, I pray, Father, that they would do that today. I pray, Father, that if there's someone who's never asked Christ to forgive them of their sins and say, I believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on my behalf, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. We pray for those young kids who we hear downstairs. What a, what a joy to hear those laughs. But, Father, save them. Save them. Make them a disciple that fears you above all else. We pray for those young people that we can be an encouragement to them and share this good news with gusto and the energy and the excitement it deserves. Because indeed it is good news. So Father, we just pray uh, just for this week as there's many different things. Thursday prayer meeting, Friday night together, Saturday. There's so much, but Father, may we not lose you in the midst of the busyness. May we, may we do all things to the glory of your Son and not be caught up with the anxiety of the world, uh, anxiety of the world, and um, may we just have peace with you this week. We just pray all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen.